The purchase of Delmere Works has allowed us to break through ceilings. We've been able to scale up the business using a common point of data, practice and real-time monitoring to near double what we're able to achieve in a day. And in many cases we found that the concentration on producing what we need to when we need to and the demand replenishment programs that the real-time facilities within Delmere Works we've been able to show free capacity that we weren't able to see prior to its introduction and adoption. Hello everyone, I'm Joe Pryweller, Conference Director for Plastics News. Welcome to Ask the Expert, our new live stream series. Ask the Expert is your chance to engage with professionals, to address the current business environment, to discuss best practices, and most importantly, ask some questions. The topic of this series is improving operations. Today's expert is Steve Bazat, Chief Marketing Officer of Delmia Works IQMS. Steve will discuss techniques of driving continuous improvement with real-time production data. He will answer your questions after his presentation. To submit a question, email pnevents at crane.com, or if you are watching along on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, Submit your questions through those platforms. With that, I will turn things over to Steve Bazat of the IQMS. Take it away, Steve. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. Uh, Steve Bazat here in Paso Robles, California. Um, let's start the presentation and I'll go over my material. So, um, you know, I've been working in um, ERP for 35 years and uh, some of it in distribution, some of it in retail, and quite a bit of it in manufacturing. I used to be a manufacturing engineer back in the early days. And um, you, you never know who's on one of these, these webcasts. So uh, I just want to make sure as we start with ERP, what I'm talking about. Um, ERP is basically a system of record. Um, and I'm talking about in a manufacturing operation where you provide your customer service, you take care of all your orders, your accounts receivable control your inventory, create your quotes and estimates, uh, maintain and manage your standard costs, do all your production planning and scheduling, uh, do your quality control, and today's topic, which is uh, production monitoring. Um, and I, I just want to add one note that is sort of contemporary to the times, which is that for a long time I've talked about the eight essential values of ERP, which I just mentioned, but with this recent um, COVID outbreak, uh, the ability uh, to maintain business continuity using ERP to do all of the aforementioned items uh, from a remote location from home has become a, a ninth essential value of, of ERP. But today I'm going to focus on production monitoring. So if we could uh, switch the slide. So, you know, production monitoring um, is, is measured at the machines, it's, a, it's, it's the measurement of physical activities at the machines. Uh, it can be stamps, it can be injection molding, it can be assembly equipment, but it's all measured right there at the machine. And it's um, typically measured in real time. So it's, it's measured as it occurs. And um, from this real time data, you can take real time actions, which I'm gonna talk about. You can go back from the recording of real-time activities and, and create new information. And uh, where I'm really gonna focus at the end is you can take uh, production data post-production, assemble it into data grids and implement continuous improvement actions. And I'll do an actual uh, walkthrough of one of those. Uh, production monitoring, interestingly enough, is, is can, can be signaled and non-signaled and and, and what I mean by that is that it can be automatically picked up by sensors on the machine, or it can actually be keyed in or clicked in by an operator. And, and what you may say in this day and age, why is anything done manually? Well, if you're doing an assembly step or a measurement step or some post, say, injection molding step, um, it's sometimes hard to instrument those. And so you have an operator click it in. But at the end of the day, you, you, you measure what happens as the machine and, and the operator are going through their cycles. So you're really measuring uh, cycles of equipment, you're measuring operator actions, and, and you're measuring rejects as operators uh, give a go, no-go signal to a particular parts dimension or quality. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so what do you get from these key measurements? Um, 
it, it, just we'll just focus on one. The machine is opening and closing. Um, well, you know the machines are running, and if they're not opening and closing, if they're not uh, stamping, then the machines are stopped, and this occur alerts uh, the, the production operation pe pe people. The um, you know the production rates. If if the machine is opening closing every you know thirty seconds and it's making four parts, then you know the rate of production, which gives you the estimated time of completion of the production run. And you know if the operators are performing all the steps in the process, if they're supposed to snap together two parts and take a take a a measurement, is that happening or is that not happening? Um, as it goes to the final step, you know your finished good counts. So you, you have a running count of finished goods for inventory if you want to ship early or ship partial shipments. And you also know your scrap rates. So from the simple act of measuring the opening and closing of the performance of certain actions at the time of production, you gain all of the insight that we see on the screen right there. Um, that's sort of what I call real time. You know, like you, at that point, you would deal with an issue just as it happened. If we go to the next slide, we can look at what I consider to be sort of financial considerations. How much raw material did I consume? I know I made a part. I know there's seven ounces of material on a part. Therefore, I'm building down my consumption of, of raw materials. I know how much labor time I had in a part. And if I know the material consumption, I know the machine time, I know the labor consumption, I can calculate my actual cost. Most manufacturers run on standard cost. So if you have your actual cost to compare to your standard cost, you can update your standard cost and keep very accurate costing uh, figures on the products that you make. You can also calculate OEE or machine utilization. You know how long it ran, you know what percentage of the day it ran, and you know how much quality it put out. So you can calculate OEE, which is a very popular uh, metric that's used today to judge effectiveness of manufacturing operations. You also know how many cycles are on your machines and on your tools so that you can maintain them according to their maintenance schedules and not start big jobs and have to stop them in the middle to do maintenance and not break tools in the middle of jobs that you know needed maintenance in advance. So you've got all these sort of what I would consider to be uh, financial considerations of how effective you can be by, by measuring uh, production during real time. And then the next slide. So if you, if, if you, if you're doing production monitoring, you, you get these benefits that you just couldn't get otherwise. And I want to summarize those and then I'm going to go on to continuous improvement. Real time identifies issues before they become big problems. If the machine is stopped, you can get right over to it and figure out what's going on. If you don't know your rate of production, you don't know when jobs are gonna finish, it's almost impossible to schedule downstream jobs. So the ability to plan, schedule, and adapt those schedules to changing conditions is made possible by real-time data. You couldn't get actual costing and estimating without actually measuring what's going on at the machine. Quality control is enforced as a step in the manufacturing process. And if it's not happening, you know that through the measurement of the real-time conditions of the machine. And if you take all of that data and you look at it historically, it enables continuous improvement programs, which is what I'll switch over to now. Next slide, please. So continuous improvement is a little bit different than the real-time use of the data or the recreating, say, actual cost from, uh, from, from the data that you recorded during the production operations. It's more about taking production data over a longer period of time and, and putting it in a grid and you know every two weeks or monthly and then looking at it whole cloth to see how you can improve your operations where over a long period of time you can see inefficiencies and how do you correct those inefficiencies. And the grids are typically built out by a product line or a product, by a machine and a tool, operators, different plants, different shifts, maybe different material suppliers. But you take all that data and you build it out into a grid, typically an Excel grid, to be quite honest, and, and you do the following actions. And I'm going to give you an example of that right now. So we go to the next slide, please. So I know a bit of an eye chart, but what we're looking at here 
is, is for vent cap uh, number 2A in periods of time, one, two, and three. Let's call those two-week periods of time. And we look at the average outputs per hour of those machines, and we see that shift two's output is quite a bit less than uh, than shift one's output, right? It's, it's, it's 120 versus 180. And if, if we look at the scrap units, we see that, you know, shift two machine, uh, machine A is creating a lot more scrap than, than the other machines. And we look at the average cycle time on that same machine and we see that it's 40 seconds and we think, okay, here's the problem, right? It's machine B on shift two. And we note that the operator is Mike. We look into the situation and we find out that, you know, Mike is fumbling with with the, with the measurement, the calibration and, and measurement of the parts. He's he's taking a long time to get it done. He's 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 measuring parts that are good that he's and he's calling them bad. So we do some more training on Mike, and we look at the next period of time, and we get up there, and, it's, and the rate of production is increased to 150, and and, and shift one's gone up to 210, and we see our scrap is down a little bit. But we still see issues um, with, with with the operations of machine A uh, shift two, and we look at it, and, and we you know we've got the cycle down to thirty, but it's just turning out that that Mike's not able to do a good job on that. So we get to period three, and we see that all um, all the operations are running at two hundred and ten parts per hour, which is great. We uh, we see that the engineers have looked at the cycle times and dialed them all into 18 seconds, and we've got an operator on uh, on that uh, other machine, Diane, who's able to uh, to to work at that rate. And we've taken all the production data, we've gone through it, we've mined it, and we've made a continuous improvement, and we've got all shifts running at 210 parts per hour, 18 second cycle times, and uh, we've made a major improvement in the business. So the next slide, please. So to, 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 to bring it to conclusion and then take questions about the topic, um, you know, you, you've got three things to look at with production data. Real time for immediate operational corrections, uh, taking the records of production to determine, you know, your basically your actual cost and be able to plan and schedule with real information. And then you've got your post-production use to find continuous improvements on a deep dive into the data. So at this point in time, I will switch over and take questions about the topic. Great, Steve. Thanks for a great presentation. Uh, we're now ready to take questions. To submit a question, you can email them to pnevents at crane.com, which you see scrolling across your screen there. Or if you are watching along on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube, submit your questions through those platforms. Here's the first question, Steve. You mentioned production and process monitoring. What exactly is the difference between the two? You know, um, production monitoring is what I talked about, about measuring cycles on the machine and, you know, the, the process that somebody goes through to, to make an actual part. Uh, process monitoring is largely done through instrumentation on the machine where you, you measure temperatures and pressures and, um, and, and different parameters automatically and you feed those into what's called a historian database and you perform analysis on, um, on those more scientific values, if you will. And you also with process data, you, you tend to set limits so that if a temperature goes over a certain value or under a certain value, or if a pressure goes over a certain value, you alert um, the technicians that something's going wrong with that production process inside the machine and and they're called process parameters and they're just they're the same but different than production values which tend to be uh, cycle times and counts okay great here's a question that came in through our pn events at crane.com email address we have an accounting and inventory system we like but don't have the production data you have spoken about will vendors provide just the production monitoring software by itself uh, yeah, th th there's a, another term of art in the industry, which is called uh, MES or manufacturing execution software. Ah, okay. And basically manufacturing execution software is the production monitoring and process monitoring end of ERP. So it's, it's not uncommon for somebody to have a, let's say they're running an SAP system as a backbone ERP, that bigger company but they don't have any production or process monitoring. So they'll buy the MES component of a, of a software package like 
Domia Works or IQMS, and they'll integrate that into their backbone um, ERP system and use one system for the production side and the other for the accounting and, and sort of the inventory management side. Great. Uh, here's a question that came through from LinkedIn. Uh, first one there for the for the session. Please ex explain the basic techniques to develop Color Master Batch, or can you provide any ebook information about Color Master Batch and additive development technologies? How do you work with uh, with Color Master Batch? You know, um, somebody asked a very difficult question that I'm I'm not qualified to answer in detail on this webcast. Um, sure, that would have to go to like a, a an engineer, a sales engineer, to answer that particular question. So. Um, I, I suppose it's okay to be stumped and, and get the name <laughs> of that person and we'll get back to them. Sounds good. Well, you can, you can take that one offline or something yeah. or, or look into that anyway. <laughs> That's fine, yeah. Uh, you know, another question that came through LinkedIn, how do you advise on how to not over adjust processes? You, you mean, I, I think the question here is it, it, not to fiddle with things continuously. Right. And, um, and, and that's that's remember when I talked about the um, the histogram, it's a it's a record of information that spans over time. And it, it basically looks like a chart going across. Um, you consult the histograms and you look to see what the variation has been in prior use cases. And if it's not outside of that and, you, and you're not really having any problems, you leave it alone. And, and, it, and if, if you see cases where it's where the process parameters or the cycle times have gone outside of that and you've had problems, you, you then honor that, but you consult the record and you look for deviations, if you want to call them standard deviations that are pretty normal and you don't over adjust. Okay, great. Uh, I, know, I know you mentioned uh, signal or non-signal and uh, entering, entering manually too and other things. At what point uh, is production data entered manually in this day and age? Why is manual data entry still in the picture? You know, there's a couple reasons. Um, one, it's very practical. Um, you, you, if you have an operator at a machine, and, and a lot of people do, and, and the operators, he's seeing the parts come off the machine. He's ascertaining whether they're good or bad. Um, he's perhaps assembling a couple. He, maybe he's taking other measurements. He's uh, labeling is, is very common. Um, if you have the operator signal that the point of time that they did that just by pushing a button or stepping on a pedal, it's very practical and very inexpensive and you get just about the same quality of data. And it also is very flexible because to electrically instrument a lot of things and then change over the job to where the operator is doing something else can require a lot of connectivity and a lot of tooling that you can actually just do by having an operator click a button and it gives you more flexibility at the work center and, and the data you'd get is just about as good as if it was hardwired. I think you mentioned non-signaling in some cases used with post-production post work and uh, it's in some of, some of those areas anyway when you're, when you're finished with the actual production of the part. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you repeat that question though? No, I, I, I'm just curious. You mentioned non-signaling non being used a lot of cases for post-production. Yeah. Is that correct? That, yeah. Well, not when you you're when you're doing signal or non-signal, you're collecting a, a lot of data. I'll, I'll just say you're collecting cycle times, you're collecting quality data, um, and 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 you're and you're collecting production rates. It all gets written down when you're dealing with real time. It's hard to sit back and really analyze what's going on a whole cloth. So. When you take you take all the history data, you put it into a grid. I typically use Excel, and you start to look for cause and effect, and you look for trends in the data. And if you look over longer periods of time, you start to see trends like like machines that are are, are not doing as good a job as another machine. One machine will run a job at a forty second cycle consistently, and another one will run a job at a twenty second cycle. And you dig into what's what is with that combination of tool and machine or what is with that operator or why is the third shift always so much slower? Why do they produce more scrap um, than, than say the first shift? You, you can see all that in real time, but when you lay it out in a post-production sense and really sit down at a desk and look at it, 
you can find underlying factors that you can change and improve productivity for the long haul. And that's what I mean by post-production use. It's basically not being hurried, having a lot of data in front of you and looking for cause and effect. I see. Not something that's related to dur during the action of it, but later on you have time to take a look at it anyway. It's it's kind of a human factor. You get all busy during the day and you're just like, yeah. well, the machine stopped running. I'm going to fix it. It's running again. Good. I fixed it, right? Sure. Uh, but it, but it, that's not really continuous improvement. That's that's just kind of dealing with issues as they come up. Continuous improvement is about finding ways to forever be more efficient and more productive and build it into your work streams. Great. Here's a question from LinkedIn. How do we, re and, I, and I'm not sure you answer this one either, but I'll, I'll ask it. Maybe through an ERP system can be done. How do we reduce the plastics dust during plastics processing? Is there a way to look at that or monitor that or any, any answer on that? Um, just asking the question here. I don't know if that's you know, the I'll, answer. I'll say this to the, 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 the person. I have been in a thousand factories and I've never heard anybody ask anything about plastics dust. Okay. <laughs> I can't answer that question. We'll leave that one alone. Uh, here's a question that came in through Facebook. Uh, why are companies still having problems with uh, plate lift? Um, Again, I don't know if that's one you can answer this, easily. This is beyond <laughs> my, my, um, my, my skill level here. Okay, let's, let's move on. It's uh, fine. Uh, you mentioned before, Steve, that during the age of COVID and the, and the, the era that we're in right now, that ERPs become more important in some cases for continuity's sake. Can you expand a little bit about what companies are doing to upgrade their ERP systems or how they're how they're using it during uh, this time of pandemic? This is something I do know about. Good, um, good. <laughs> yeah, the um, this is it's been my observation that, and, it, and it's real, is that ERP, you know, prior to COVID was. There are ERP affection areas. We call them super users, power users, companies that just run their ERP all day long and, and basically use it as a center point in the business. There's a whole bunch more companies that use ERP to do the basics of their operations, to keep track of inventory, keep track of orders, do scheduling, planning. Um, but they didn't use it as much as they should. They, they relied on being on premise, they relied on, you know, experts, supervisors, uh, going down and checking inventory levels, things like that. And when COVID hit, the, the need to minimize the number of people on site and to have as many people as possible work from home really exposed the value of actually using your ERP as a complete system of record and making sure that everybody uses it and keeps all the information up to date. And you could get away without doing that when everybody was at the shop. But when everybody had to go home and you had to have the absolute minimum people, number of people on the floor at the same time and rejigger production, you know, two or three or four times a week and stagger shifts, um, the value of automating that and using the ERP tool to do that and, and to be the system of record and be where people went to get information and, and leave information. Um, I, I've just never seen it more evident and um, I think that what you're seeing today is people who ran QuickBooks, they're getting to get an ERP system because they were left high and dry with no real ability to, to run their business remotely. People that have an older legacy system that didn't have a effective document control or production monitoring capability, um, they're upgrading those systems. And then those who have a modern ERP system, be it ours or Epicor, Plex, there's a, there's a bunch of good ones out there. Uh, they really enjoyed the benefits of ERP because they could work home and they could do more stuff remotely. Ah, it's all, all important aspects right now and, uh, with, with what we're dealing with. Um, a question that came in via email, uh, do you have a solution for compounding? Does this work with compounders also? Yeah, we do. We I, I, I don't know the exact number of compounders we have, but somewhere between 50 and 70 compounders. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Yes. Compounding um, is really extruding, and, and 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 we treat it as that. The system has really quickly. It's twenty seven manufacturing types, and one of them is compounding. Good. If if you're a, a mid sized processor, which is a lot of our audience, how difficult is it to get started on this, or really move move well into this an ERP system or a, a production monitoring system, process monitoring system that you talked about? Um, it it. 
it's not a you know it's not a drop kick. I mean, sure. you have to um, you have to dedicate yourself to getting the um, the information about your business into the system. That's the that's the biggest hurdle. You have to get your accounting records into it. You have to get your inventory records into it. You have to get your standard costs, your bills and material into it. Um, and then you have to train the staff on, on all the keystrokes. It takes three months, four months, depending on the size of the business. It can take longer in a really big business. Um, but once you're there, then you start to enjoy all the benefits of the return on investment of, you know, of, of just having your accounts receivable under control, knowing what your inventory values are, being able to schedule um, an ERP system in a $20 million business will save that business between three and $4 million a year between managing uh, money and managing inventory levels and productive output. Um, so it, it's a hurdle to get over in the beginning. Um, but what you'll find in the industry is that about 70% of the businesses are running an ERP and about 30% are still running QuickBooks. And we call those Greenfield accounts. And, um, and, and those Greenfield accounts are coming out and it's going to, uh, we, above a $5 million business, it's going to, you know, aiming towards 100% of ERP utilization. Then it starts to become, well, which ERP are you using and how modern is it and how much of it am I using effectively? Do all departments need to get involved in this as far as collaborating between uh, between different areas of the business besides just the production folks anyway? Yeah, it, it runs all the way uh, from, you know, I mean, obviously the ownership's trying to build profitable growth. The finance people are trying to, you know, keep track of the money. Uh, the salespeople are wanting to be able to deliver their orders on time and deliver the quality products on into the production people, the warehouse people, the quality people, the maintenance people. It touches basically everybody in a manufacturing operation. And that's pretty unique for a software package. Most of them, you know, focus on one or two roles within a business, but ERP is comprehensive up and down. Great. Well, Steve, no more questions have come in. So we'll right. end our, our audience uh, Q&A at this point. But before we go, I want to ask you if you had, you had any final comments that you want to impart to the audience about, about process and product production monitoring or anything else. Well, no, just I, I'm a big bill. I don't know how you could run a manufacturing operation without recording what's going on at the time of production. And for those people who who try to get away without doing it, I, I think just think about, you know, how much more you can know about your business if you if you do measure the events at the time of production and then analyze them for effectiveness. And um, I guess my final comment would be I'm going to go look up the issue about dust. Um, <laughs> well, let me know what you find, I guess. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Again, I want to thank uh, Steve Bazzotta of Delmia Works IQMS for helping us understand the ins and outs of using production data to drive continuous improvement. If you have additional questions for Steve, please feel free to reach out to him directly at the email address listed on the screen below. I'd like to thank Steve Bazzotta for sharing his insights today, and I'd like to thank the audience for watching. Don't forget to tune in time tomorrow for another Ask the Expert session, this one with Nexio Plastics, as well as upcoming sessions on Thursday and Friday, uh, one on Thursday with Canon Virginia and one on Friday with Fortify. Have a great day, everyone. The purchase of Delmia Works has allowed us to break through ceilings. We've been able to scale up the business using a common point of data, practice and real-time monitoring to near double what we're able to achieve in a day. And in many cases, we found that the concentration on producing what we need to when we need to, and the demand replenishment programs that the real-time facilities within Delmia Works, we've been able to show free capacity that we weren't able to see prior to its introduction and adoption.